Monday, June 4th, 1979, was a rainy morning. The political campaign towards elections, presidential and parliamentary for the Third Republic, was in full swing. J.J. Rawlins and the coup plotters of May 15th were behind bars. And then suddenly, a coup arrived. <laughs> The generations of Ghanaians who were living in Ghana at that time were those who had had close proximity to the rouse of 28 February 1948, the political tensions of the First Republic, the coup d'etat of 1966, and had also heard and seen the excellent speeches of Prime Minister Buzia. And they, that group, had largely orchestrated civil disobedience to force strongman Kutua Champon to hand over to civilian rule. This was the generation that mobilized professionals under the PMFFJ to unseat military rule. So on the morning of 15 May, everyone was angry that another coup was occurring when everything was ready for constitutional rule. Now, the reaction to that, to that attempt all around the country from all our reporters was, oh, please. These soldiers, we are tired. What's this? We are going back to uh, civilian rule. We are going to have elections. Why is somebody trying to stage a coup again? That was the general impression. And I believe even among the military at the time. This anger of the people against coups must have been the reason why the AFRC was forced to maintain the order to hand over power soon after the June 4th revolution. So a complicated calendar emerged. The coup occurred on June 4th. Parliamentary and presidential elections were fought on the 18th of June. The executions were carried out on the 26th of June. The second round of the presidential election occurred in July, and the handover to civilian rule occurred in September. All of this in 1979, a dramatic June to September for all of Ghana's history. So what was the June 4th coup about, and who organized it? The June 4th uprising was the brainchild of rank-and-file soldiers. No officer, and I repeat, no officer was involved in its initial stages. It was born out of years of frustration and anger with the officer corps, whose frequent military interventions, mismanagement, and ineptitude had brought our country almost to its knees. Our soldiers wanted to protest against the dictatorship of their superiors. Be that as it may, was the coup also intended by J.J. Rawlings to be a political advert for the future? Was J.J. launching a bigger political career beyond the rhetoric and the choboy of a revolution? Here is Elizabeth Ohine, who was editor of the graphic at the time. Fly Lieutenant Rawlings said to me that, oh, uh, he was going to lead the group of soldiers that were going to see off General Akufo at the airport. Because General Akufo, having become chairman of the SMC2, that day he was going to, I think, the Gambia and Senegal. And Fly Lieutenant Rawlings said to me that, oh, he was going to be the officer who was going to lead the guard of honor at the airport. Could I please send, make sure that uh, the graphic cameras capture this? So at the meeting, the graphic, the morning meeting where we send out reporters and such, I declared an interest. I said, to my colleagues at the meeting that I have an interest. There's a friend of mine who is going to lead the detachment that will see of um, the guard of honor for General Kufo. That can the cameraman who is going please make sure that they take a photo of him. He's called Fly Lieutenant Rollins. And everybody laughed. And we put this picture of Fly Lieutenant Rollins leading the guard of honor detachment on the front page of the graphic. 
a few days later, Fra Lieutenant Rollins stages or attempts to stage a coup May 15th. This is a few days later. So that day, as it happened, the graphic was the only person that had a photo of the person who had tried to stage the coup. And why did we have a photo? Because we had photographed him leading this detachment at the airport. So that's, that's the only reason we had the photo of him. Who then was the AFRC and how was it formed? Apparently, Captain Edmund Koda had recently said, and I read it in the papers, that the AFRC was formed in the classroom. I won't dispute that, because we were in a lecture hall. We were in a lecture hall at the Air Force Base, and I believe that was where the AFRC was formed, and of course in my absence. And then news came through that uh, Brockerson House had been recaptured by Major Suleimana and some of his recce elements. So I decided, well, what I started has got to be finished. So I'm going to go out and deal with this new threat. Justice Kwame Afre talks about how the AFRC operated. Uh, the AFRC, AFRC government consisted of two main organs. The AFRC itself, made up of the chairman, as Claire left and uh, Rawlings, then the deputy chairman, or Sahine Bachijan, about four commissioned officers, and I think a majority of people of, of, of other ranks. And then there was a council of commissioners, which consisted of the commissioners or ministers who run the ministries. As Osayin himself said, they inherited us from SMC2. Now, in between these two organs, the Air Piracy installed or, uh, the, the Elation Officer. I think the name is a bit long, but Elation Officer, and the person of J General Joshua Hamidu, through whom the two organs occasionally communicated. The Air Piracy met and took its decisions without consulting the commissioners. I cannot recall that the AFRC and the council ever met together. With your permission, I'd just like to contrast this with what happened in the SMC. The SMC, you have the Supreme Military Council consisting of the senior military officer who considered that council. But then there was a larger group called the National Redemption Council, which they had inherited from SMC1. And I think every month, or at least every two months, once every two months, all the SMC members and all the uh, commission, uh, all the commissioners met at cabinet meetings. But we didn't have this particular system operating under the AFRC. So the AFRC came in when the timetable for constitutional rule had already been set up. No changes were made to that timetable. What then did the revolution seek to achieve? And how did that help the course of Ghana? I'm afraid to say, not much. Not much at all. The high point of the AFRC discussion is the killings, the executions. The first thing the AFRC did was to pass a decree creating special courts to trial people. The trial courts were said to be sitting at the presidential Peduase Lodge in the Eastern region. The trial process was horrendous. The courts were actually kangaroo courts, and they convicted their victims of anything they found them guilty of. They gave them huge sentences and prescribed execution for some of them. These courts struggled for credibility. At some point, they claimed that they had relied on the Criminal Code Act 29 as it then was, so that persons who overthrew or participated in the overthrow of constitutionally elected regimes were charged and found guilty of treason and they were killed by execution. That's the reason they gave for the killing of Kutua Champon and Utuka. But 
Could there have been another reason for the killing of Achampo and others? General Achampo was deemed to have been the leader of a coup which overthrew Dr. Busia's PP government and which overthrew Ghana's Second Republic. General Champon was executed as much for the dishonor he had brought to the Ghana Armed Forces. Let's face it, soldiers were shy of our civilian counterparts. We had absolutely no respect from our own compatriots. Why? Because we were soldiers. Urine was being poured on our soldiers who were being sent out on police duties. We were soldiers, not policemen. We wanted to soldier. I left the university. And I went in as a regular, a career officer, because I loved soldiering. I wanted to soldier. And here was I, another officer, perhaps even without my background academic qualification, refusing to share a toilet with me. He was a political officer. Now, if an officer would treat a fellow officer that way, how contemptuous would he be towards our civilian folk? General Champo had no chance. But perhaps the AFRC may have been magnanimous. They may have sacrificed, they may have opted to spare his life. I don't know, but that is a moot point. I wasn't a member of the council. But my information is that there were other parochial motives for the general's execution. A cabal of tribalists who have come to be known as the Jelukope Mafia wanted General Echampon dead. One aspect that has not been widely publicized is the grand drama that occurred before Kutu Echampon was executed. The set drama is contained in this book, Ghana, a Chroma to Rollins, is by Emmanuel Dozoglu, Volume 1, and it covers 1957 to 1993. On page 461, the subtitle, A Champon's Last Words, Before He and Major General Utuka Were Shot by Firing Squad, is called from Young and Old, August 1991. It reads, Former Head of State, the late General Ignatius Kutu Achampong, did not know that the soldiers of the AFRC era will kill him on June 16, 1979. If he knew, he would not have opened his mouth to speak his last words in the manner that he did. Kutua Champon's last words were spoken on Wednesday, 13th June, but 72 hours later on 16th of June, Kutu was dead and gone, having been executed by firing squad together with Major General E.K. Utuka, a member of Achampon's SMC1 government. It is significant to add that when Kutu spoke his last words to the soldiers at Burma camp, they found Achampon's last words too sweet, quote-unquote, to believe. They therefore decided that everybody should hear what Achampon had to say. They therefore carried him to the army headquarters, Accra. Now, these are his last words. He said, unquote, I pledge my full support for the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council, which toppled the SMC2 government headed by General Akufu on June 4th. In pledging this support, I am not in any way being sycophantic because I am aware that the AFRC is taking stringent measures to solve the country's problems, something my government and that of General Akufu could not do. Achampong continued, and I quote, I have no regrets for staging the 1972 coup which toppled Dr. Busia's government and looking back at my reign as Ghana's head of state from January 13, 1972 to July 5, 1978, when General Akufu and others removed me from office, I feel I have done enough for Ghana. I can't claim to be infallible. Perhaps my only fault was that I was too lenient and kind. I helped people like J.H. Mensa, Apia Minka, and Dr. Bilson to make money, even though I was aware they were my political enemies. General Akufu and others have accused me of running the government as a one-man show. They are liars, and that accusation against me is baseless because every action taken during my tenure of office was a collective one. General Achampong continued, and this is on page 462. On July 5th, 1978, when some of the SMC members asked me to resign, I pointed out to them 
that it was not me as an individual that Ghanaians did not want. I told General Fred Akufu that they were looking for all of us. I warned General Akufu that he would regress this action and that he was going to create more confusion. My removal was not endorsed by all the SMC members." Unquote. Still making the statement, General Kutua Champon parried off some accusations. He said, for instance, on page 463, as follows. At separate times, Mr. Kofi Anane Binfo, then Senior Principal Secretary, Ministry of Finance, and Lieutenant Colonel Akompi were those responsible, and therefore, if any of them had diverted part of the import licenses for their personal use, I cannot tell." Unquote. He continued, Before my overthrow, an investigation into an aircraft deal revealed that Air Vice Marshal Bozuli, former Air Force commander, was seriously involved in the corrupt deal. After the report on the deal was made to me, General Akufu approached me to say that Air Vice Marshal Bozuli had asked him, General Akufu, to beg me on his behalf." Unquote. Also as part of the statement, Kutua Champo answered the most famous allegation against him, the allegations of his debauchery and lasciviousness. He says as follows, unquote, It is not true that I bought golf cars for my numerous girlfriends. I don't deny that I had girlfriends. All of us have girlfriends, even you. Which of you flirts with your wives only? We all do it. And to me, I don't see how girlfriends contributed to the ruin of Ghana's economy. No one can claim to be a paragon of virtue. We all do it." Unquote. Thus, Yutuka and Achampon were the first to be killed. Everyone was shocked, and anyone of influence in Ghana tried to make moves to halt the killings, but all of that was to no avail. General Afifre's execution was the most unwarranted. He was accused of overthrowing Nkrumah in the 1966 coup, whilst General Ankara, who was part and leader of the coup, was not tried. Worse still, Section 37 of the Transitional Provisions of the 1969 Constitution had indemnified all coup makers, so that should have covered Afrifa if this was a regular trial. But this was not a trial at all, where the accused person did not see the faces of the judges and didn't know how many judges were trying him. He only saw a glass screen in front of him. General Akwesia Mankwa Efrifa had actually removed his military clothes. He had become a full civilian, participated in politics, and actually was elected the UNC Member of Parliament in Mampong in the elections of June 18th, a few days after the coup. He had won the election on the ticket of the UNC as the only candidate to have won a seat in Ashanti region for William Oforiate's party. On June 26, 1979, the unthinkable happened. On the 26th of June, 1979, Member of Parliament-elect Akwesia Mankwa Efrifa and five others were killed in cold blood in the second round of executions. The executions were senseless, unnecessary, and dastardly. Former Minister of Finance and former Vice-Chancellor of the University of Ghana, Professor George Bennett told the story about how the executions ended in his autobiography. Writing his autobiography entitled, My Time, My Nation, the former Vice-Chancellor and Minister of Finance recounts on page 84 under the subtitle, The Executions of Military Officers, as follows. He says, as I recall, four of us were selected, Dr. Joe Abbey, D.K. Afre, Mrs. Gloria Nikwe, and myself. We went to the Air Force Base to meet members of the AFRC. We argued out our case against the executions. Some of them were not convinced. I remember clearly that D.K. Afre was very smart. When he realized that we were not making headway in our presentations, believing that it might be better if we spoke in vernacular to make the discussions more informal, he decided to change the language of the discussion to Akan. That played the trick, and some of the soldiers were more forthcoming in their contributions. I remember one of the soldiers telling us that they will not go ahead, but they had killed soldiers, and it was important that they kill at least one civilian to pacify everybody. The name they were mentioning was Boache Matres. He was a prominent businessman. 
that at least he must be killed. We continued to plead for his life, but we're not making any headway. So we thanked them and appealed to them to consider our request, and we left. We then prepared the statement for consideration by Chairman Rawlings. Later, General Hamido informed us that he had taken our statement to him, and to our greatest delight and surprise, Chairman Rawlings made the broadcast, more or less reading the statements that we had prepared. That was a crucial moment in the revolution because it really called the executions to a halt. So that was June 4th, a horrible, dastardly, unwarranted uprising. Many years later, during the celebration of the June 4th uprising, Flight Lieutenant Rawlings described the Third Republic which he overthrew as a naive interruption to the revolutionary course. In about two days' time, as you all know, will be the eighth anniversary of our long march. The long march that was naively and rudely interrupted, the march that was begun in 1979, which was fortunately resumed again on 31st December 1981. On the same occasion, J.J. Rollins complained about how June 4th celebrations had become synonymous with profanity from the soldiers. I would like to make one little appeal, a personal one. Our mothers and wives are beginning to complain about uh, some of the songs that our little ones are picking up. And they were hoping that we would tone down on some of their profanities. Of course, we can step them up outside of uh, the barracks or wherever the children in the absence of the children. But um, otherwise, I would like us to sing some of the other ones that we know about. One of the most popular ones that I used to know, somehow I don't even hear anymore. The one that goes, That's right. You see what I mean? Mm. And if the whole lot of us should pick on his Zamana, I know we would shake up a crowd. So let's not forget it next time. June 4th continued to be celebrated as a holiday, even under the constitutional rule of the Fourth Republican Constitution of 1992. And they did so, even though the Supreme Court had ruled in a separate matter that the other JJ coup of 31st December 1981 cannot be celebrated as a public holiday because it was an illegal act. The most tensed celebration of the June 4th Revolution was in 1995. This was so because less than a month before the celebration, Nana Ado Dankwa Ekufuado, Charles Reku Brobe, Kweku Baku Jr., Kwesi Pratt Jr., Dr. Nyaho Tamaklu, Mr. Kakraba Cromwell, Mr. Akoto Ampao, and Mr. Kweku Poku had all led what became the biggest ever demonstration in Ghana. They called it the Kumi Preko demonstration. More than 100,000 people were on the street in protest against JJ's government. This seemed bigger than June 4th, and on the occasion of the 16th anniversary of June 4th, Flight Lieutenant Rawlings for the first time seemed rattled and issued threats to the opposition in a harsh manner, similar to the way he spoke in 1979 and in 1981. However, ladies and gentlemen, let no one underestimate our capacity and resolve to react appropriately if their ugly noises provoke ugly actions from their blind followers. During the other celebrations of June 4 whilst JJ was president, sometimes he was sober, even occasionally expressing regret for the things that had happened at June 4, but still making his point. June 4 therefore belongs to the people of this country and they have a right to measure those of us in leadership today by the yardstick of June 4th, 1979. Ladies and gentlemen, there are some who say the times and conditions have changed. They say the excesses of June 4th era should not be glorified or made a part of national life. No. 
we do not glorify the excesses of June 4th, but we glorify its principles, and all of us must remember that principles are principles and they never change. When John Adekum Kufour became president in the year 2001, the celebration of June 4th was immediately outlawed by an amendment to the Holiday Act. So what's the legacy of June 4th? Let's find out from the president of the Fourth Republic. J.J. Rawlings made it a holiday. John Kufour, President Mills, President Mahama, and President Akufuado all did not make it a holiday. So the verdict is J.J. 1, Kufour, Mills, Mahama, and Akufuado 4. Thus, J.J. has lost. The perpetual flame lit for June 4th must die. What shall we then say to June 4th? We can say, good night, June 4th, good night. And when morning comes, please don't wake up. No one wants to see you. Never again will June 4th be given a national salute. Right. National salute! And yes, the June 4th cheers will never be heard again. Goodbye, June 4th. Goodbye. Ghana will never do this again. Oh,